You are listening to the Water in Real Life podcast, the podcast for people who want to become better leaders by becoming better communicators. Why? Because those who tell the stories rule the world. We're your hosts, the H2 duo, Stephanie Corso and Ariane Shipley. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Holy cow, y'all. Are you ready for this conversation that's about to happen? I don't know if you are. I am so excited to have this fun bunch of folks together. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody that we've we've got with us today. I'm going to start with Samantha Viegas. Samantha is Director of Strategic Communication Services for Raftelis and has been conducting public outreach for Public Works for more than 25 years. Going on to Duke Greenhill after 20 years in movies and advertising. He's now the chair of advertising and branding, graphic design and visual experience and brand entertainment. Lots of commas there at SCAD, which is the Savannah College of Art and Design. His work and writings are cited in over half a million industry and academic journals. Wendy Wilkes is the regulatory and legislative affairs manager at the Association of Straight State Drinking Water Administrators, uh, or ASDWA, as we say, because, you know, acronyms. She's also a policy grad student at Johns Hopkins, a self-described water problem solver living in Washington, D.C. And Sri Varachalam is the director of water at the Environmental Policy Innovation Center and is constantly working to demystify water policies to bring the fastest improvements in equity and environmental outcomes. So, wow. (laughs) Hello, panel. How are y'all doing this morning today? So excited to be here. I wanted to set a little bit of context before we hopped into this conversation. We're going to be talking about consumer confidence reports, also known as water quality reports, also known as CCRs. So if you hear us use that language interchangeably throughout, we're talking about the same things. Uh, CCRs, Ariane and I, having been public educators in municipal water utilities, um, we have like a love-hate relationship with CCRs. Um, Hate. I think Ariane called me during almost every CCR season while she was at Mansfield um, about to quit. But that's because like they were doing CCRs at like level 11. And so we really our magazines and, you know, yeah, big magazines, things. calendars. Um, so we're talking we're talking about kind of the opposite today. And that's like CCRs at level zero. <laughs> And kind of the baseline that exists today and why we are so passionate and believe that we can do better and that we can use this um, as a really strong tool for us to communicate some of the most important information that our customers need to know about the water that they're drinking and the safety and quality of that um, as a means to build public trust and to rebuild that confidence in the services that we're providing. So that's why we're all here. Um, Sri actually works, like I said, with Epic. We're gonna we're gonna call it because again, acronyms. And he reached out to us to ask to pick our brains about our work with it. His organization had a contest around that. Sam Viegas uh, company, Raftelis, actually won that contest. We got I got to be a judge for that contest, and so um, that's kind of how all that came together. Wendy's here to talk to us about how like states can help collaborate and kind of push this conversation forward. And Duke is our human being marketing advertising Jedi expert who's going to make sure that we keep this focused on the audience and the communities that we're serving and who we're trying to speak to. So without further ado, I'm going to hop into this. Um, At Rogue Water Lab, we believe water is the catalyst for community transformation that we as an industry have the opportunity and ability to drive real change in real communities. And and I have to say, Wendy, that I saw your post about that very same topic and was so excited to see you feeling the same way. Uh, But why is the way we communicate with our communities specifically through the consumer confidence confidence reports an important part of that? And Wendy, I'm gonna start with you. Well, good day, everybody. And thanks for having us, me, I guess. I'm sure everybody else agrees. But <laughs> thank you for having us. <laughs> Speak for everybody. Um, yeah, well, great question. I mean, I'm not a communications expert, but it I, it doesn't take a communications expert to realize that if you aren't telling your story that somebody else is or somebody else has the opportunity to. So I think, first of all, recognizing that um, this is 
the only required communication under the Safe Drinking Water Act, assuming you don't have any violations that trigger the public notice notification rules. But, um, you know, this is required by law. So um, it is a regulatory reason to be, uh, you know, engaged on this. But it's also an opportunity to tell your story. Um, the CCR can't be everything to everybody, but um, it is absolutely an opportunity to leverage an existing requirement into something more. Yeah, I totally agree. I was going to say, just to add on to that, it, for me, it was an opportunity because it was required to um, always be approved of a larger budget Yeah, because we had to get it out there. And so it was an easier selling point for my director to convince the higher ups that this is why this amount of money is in this line item and don't question it. <laughs> It's required. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you think about um, if you're a, a comms person at a utility thinking, how can I, you know, engage more, communicate more? It's going to be easier, I think, to get an increase in funds to change the way you do the CCR or to better the CCR versus starting uh, from scratch yeah. um, and, and, you know, starting a new vertical of communication. So, um, like, like I said, it can be everything, but it can definitely be, I think it was Ariane who said a foundational piece of communication, or, or maybe yeah. that was Stephanie when we were talking earlier. And I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Um, and since I also wanted to start with you to kind of set the stage for why for us, especially this conversation is important. Um, can you just kind of talk about like your thoughts about how, we're more than just a utility. We're more than just a water provider that we really can be this like pillar for change in our communities. And I'm, I'm putting you on the spot because I did see that social media post and I was like, Oh yes, Wendy. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I get for going off on Twitter. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. No, it's true. I told a story on, on Twitter about when I was first in DC, I was working for the mayor waterworks association and I, I was hosting a, um, meeting around the, the drinking water state revolving fund and opportunities to um, improve it essentially. And, uh, you know, I made this, of course I was like a kid, right. I'm 22 or something, 24. And, you know, I'm in front of these just amazing leaders in the water industry. And I, it's in the morning and I'm like talking and introducing the subject. And I make this comment about how water systems are pillars of the community um, and later, you know, I said it maybe a little flippantly, but I did mean it. And, and later one of the leaders came up to me and, you know, jaded and cynical and was like, did you really mean that pillar of the community? Like, come on. And, you know, I was like, no, I mean, I really, I really think that, I mean, there's, and if you're not treating yourself that way, how terrible, <laughs> like, you know, so I, I've seen that sentiment changed since I've been in the industry. You know, I started working in water in 2013 um, and I have seen it change uh, pretty dramatically, I would say. And, and the understanding that water is not a silent service as, you know, it, it used to be. And part of that change has come from very negative reasons, right? Flint and uh, PFAS, uh, you know, thinking about North Carolina and the Hollywood film that was made about it. I mean, you know, clearly it's broken through the, the public consciousness. And for me, it's not so much, oh gosh, you know, I wish that didn't happen. And it's more of like, seize the opportunity, right? Like we have been asking and asking as an industry to have better recognition, recognition to, for people to realize the value of water. And here it is, here's our opportunity. So, you know, I'm seize the day kind of uh, feeling about that. <laughs> I have some socks that I have about seeds today that I'll have to show you when we get back yeah. into conference season. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> nice. Well, Shri, um, you at Epic, y'all did some research that was in conjunction with a CCR contest. Um, and that was pretty telling. Can you give us some of your biggest insights that the research told us? Sure. Before that, I want to maybe like take you into a sort of different you know thinking scenario i love it so if, you want, if you if you want to know the weather what do you do right you turn to an app you google you don't go to the national weather service you know i, I mean i'm sure some people do which is you know a legitimate source for information 
but the easiest best source is sitting in our hands mm-hmm. on our phone on our computer and that's what we do of course you can go out and you know find you know a rough temperature uh, but you know getting the forecast how is it going to look like tomorrow all of that water quality doesn't change that much so obviously you don't need that kind of a dynamic app but it would be nice if you just google and said how safe is my water and then suddenly you know some information that's relevant comes mm-hmm. now i did that recently and my local utility comes in as the eighth search on the list and a neighboring utility was the 10th so on the front page they're way at the bottom and it's not obvious so it's not like a pop up that comes up and says your water quality here here's a list of contaminants even even the way the complex information is in ccrs even that doesn't show up so you have to go dig deep a second level third level search yeah. so that's sort of the background you know just general so so that got us thinking you know what is the state of information that we are presenting right now and uh, we we wanted to do you know some sort of research on let's get some data obviously there's a lot of other published work on ccrs and their you know level of understanding and you know accessibility uh, and so we collected a bunch of uh, roughly 300 ccrs they were representative of some of the larger systems mm-hmm. so you know epa has this five category system very large large medium small very small we we sort of left out the the bottom two sections because they are much smaller systems typically don't have websites so harder to search um so we took the those top three big categories uh we took 300 uh, utilities and and we just downloaded all the ccrs so obviously you know there are different ways of doing that epa has a a voluntary database mm-hmm. which is a somewhat somewhat of an equivalent so i'm talking about this google search some sort of database if you want to know what's the water source uh you know water quality at your house maybe at the place your child goes to a daycare or school your workplace and in, in some cases they might all be different because of the way you are you know situated um and, and so finding that information can be challenging so you know go to the epa source um that has uh, about 5% of the systems have ccrs linked on that page so that that database is almost obsolete it's not functioning yeah. at this point um so so that's one second is uh, you know we we sort of downloaded these uh, reports to to look at uh, you know how you would how you would take in that information uh right now it it does seem like uh the information that's in the ccr is somewhat similar to what you would see on a prescription label you know you you get this big sheet dense complex information you have a medication you really want to get better you know you're sick some way you have a headache fever uh flu whatever you you try to take some medication you're not looking at that label you're not reading it at all you're just taking it because somebody told you to uh so that's basically what it is or you or you download a software you know you you download zoom or some software there is a there's a big description that says you know here are the conditions under which you're downloading i'm sure nobody reads it it's just a accept go on so that's basically where our ccr it's it's a compliance regulatory compliance document at this point uh it's meant to satisfy some you know requirements that utilities have to um and the customer doesn't see it as a, a functional tool that helps you know give them some yeah. information uh and it, it it's at various levels so it's it's at reading level the reading levels are really high they are they're well above a college level whereas the average reader is you know roughly eighth grade uh, you know they, they read at that level so that's one thing second is translation you know do you do you, are you able to read this in languages other than english and epa has guidelines on that so epa says if you have a community that has significant population of non english speakers then you got to have you know this document available in different languages again our database of these 300 uh, uh, reports we found that about 10% of the reports have some sort of translation in another language um and you, if you if you shrink that pool to locations where there are exceeding high number of uh, non english speakers that number just goes up to 13% mm-hmm. so it's not like those translated documents are coming from places where there are lots of you know um korean or, or mandarin or you know spanish speakers it's it's not that so so we have a real problem and even these documents are designed in such a way that screen readers cannot you know extract information from them so if you are a person with uh, some sort of a visual impairment and you use some sort of a visual aid to read the document there's a certain layout you know you go from the you know sort of upper left hand corner and then you go down there is a figure there is a table there is a caption Uh, and then you move to the next so there is a certain order and our eyes sort of know how to do that screen readers don't mm-hmm. so they need the tools uh which are embedded within the document and most documents fail that test mm-hmm. so so that's the, that sort of told us that you know despite all the sort of broader challenges of the ccr the document itself is not really meant for conveying information that's helpful to the customer mm-hmm. 
I love that you compared it to a prescription label. That is so true. I just picked up a prescription for my son from, um, you know, the local pharmacy and there's the, the stapled package of, <laughs> of, you know, 20 pages. And, and my first, I rip it off and I only go to the side effects and double check real quick to make sure there's nothing I need to be too concerned about. And then I throw it away. I don't even yeah. bother reading anything else. Yeah. Oh, right. that's great. I read the instructions and then I, I actually only look at the other stuff until I like, I'm like, wow, I feel a little funny. And then I'm like, maybe it's the medicine <laughs> exactly. I'm taking. And then I go look then. So yeah, if that's what we're sending people, then no wonder that they're only looking at it when something like, is right. going wrong. Right. Exactly. And that's, and that's okay. If, if there is a broader sense of trust in the water system yeah. and you are not forced to doubt it, then you're like, okay, yeah. I don't need to look at CCR because I know this is good water. My neighbors feel so, I feel so, or I've heard. But that's not the case. Yeah. You know, there's a recent research that showed uh, 60 million people in the U.S. do not drink water because they mistrust. Did you say 60? And 60, 60 million, yes. And Get the U.S. Everybody. population, <laughs> yeah, the population in the U.S. that drinks tap water is about 300 million. So, you know, a fifth of your, you know, population basically is not, trusting is not drinking water. So if that was a company which has lost, yeah. you know, you know, a fifth of their clientele, that company is dead in the water right there. Yeah. Right. And, and, a, uh, and a big section of that, a third of that, 20 million people uh, stop drinking after Flint. So, mm -hmm. you know, big events have big consequences. That's right. And, and this is DEFCON 1 situation for the water sector. You know, if you're, if you're losing clientele at this rate, you are not going to survive. Um, so, so that's that's sort of the backdrop. I mean, CCRs do play a role there, but there's a broader engagement, broader question of, you know, how do we engage with our customers? Yeah, that trust is really important. And that's probably why I don't read the document so well on the at the pharmacy, because I've already asked a lot of those tough questions to my doctor face to face, totally trust them. They're not going to send me anything that's going to affect my kid in some crazy way. Um so yeah, you're, that's a good point. Thank right, you. and then in, in that analogy, I mean, there are lots of other players uh, who are also there who you may not trust. I mean, you do trust your pharmaceutical company, maybe, but you're not sure. You don't know them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you trust your insurance provider? I doubt. I mean, you know, they're there, nice people on the you know back end of the phone, but really don't know the doctor. Yes, because you know them. Yeah, you yeah. you know you work with them. Your kid goes there. So so you have a certain relationship. So that's that's the kind of missing link there. We need right, that right. relationship with somebody, a human person, you know, a, a set of individuals and organizations. Mm. So I think when we've had this conversation before, one of the, one of the other insights that came out of that, that was interesting to me was a, the, the different opinions from different stakeholders about the CCR. And it's like, whether you were talking to a utility, to a state regulator, to a consumer, kind of the different perceptions of the CCR too. And then B, I think the last time we had talked, you had mentioned how, some utilities expressed um, some hesitancy to work with outside vendors to improve their their water quality reports. So, can you can you touch on either of those a little bit more? So, we have uh, uh, following up from our, uh, the the water data prize last year. We've, we've had a lot of engagement with with utilities, with state agencies, with uh, even EPA, uh, and because because the whole concept is you know radical, but at the same time so simple. Right. It, here's a tool we can use to con convey information to our customers, build trust. Uh, and the tool itself is somewhat sophisticated, but it can be made simpler. And, and we have the kind of technology now. We have visualization. We have you know, different kinds of software. We can provide this information to the customers. But, but to the utilities, you know, how do they actually go through that process? It's, it's challenging for one utility to do it. But if there was a sort of a bigger template, you know, here is an idea that anybody can plug and play. You know, that's easy. We can do that. If, if you were to, you, you were asked to design a word software, like writing software, you know, nobody would do it. But if you are given a word software and said, type something and print it out, you know, that's easy. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. So that's, that's the concept. So utilities are, you know, interested in doing something that they're, they're interested in communicating with their customers. But if there was an easy tool and they're not sure who is going to build that tool and is that going to be superimposing you know, somebody else's values and, and constraints on them. So, so there is that tension. And, you know, this is not just CCR. They, they work with consultants, they work with uh, engineers. Um, and and they, they're used to being told, do this, do this, because, you know, this is good for your system. This is good, good for your community. This is how you apply for a loan. So small water systems, especially without uh, adequate expertise, they're, they're always relying on these outside consultants. And sometimes it can be a little too much. So, so we got a little bit of feedback from, 
some of the smaller systems that, you know, we want to do this, but we're not sure if, you know, who's doing it, what's mm -hmm. the, what's the deal? Why are we getting it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, you know, so, so those are real questions. So we, we got to answer that and, and work with these systems. Um, and, and, you know, we are, we are in consultation, in uh, conversations with these systems. So, you know, we, we are hoping that, you know, a lot of these small systems do find something that a, a tool that they can trust, a, a group that they can work with um, in, in getting to the end goal that, you know, they desire. Sam, I'm going to throw that question to you as well, um, you know, regarding that hesitancy of, the, of outsourcing those CCRs. And, you know, can you tell us, um, you know, your perspective on that? You're, you're a vendor, you're also working, you do CCRs for other people or have in the past. So tell us what you, um, what values that outside firms can, can offer those small utilities to. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I, I really appreciate Shree's, you know, context that yeah, he provided yeah. in terms of the declining trust in tap water. Um, there's also like this increasing cost consciousness. I think, you know, it was happening before the pandemic and then the pandemic just made that even more the case where you have people choosing between, you know, meds, rent, utility bills yeah, yeah. over the last year. But here's the thing tap water is the best freaking kept secret in terms of value. There is nothing else in your household that you pay less for that brings you more value to your life. That makes you makes life happen, makes it easy. And, and that's the crazy thing, a penny per gallon, a dollar a day, usually for people to live their life because that's what water enables. So I want to just, I have to say that first. Um, and, you know, there's a number of things that utilities themselves can do before they even outsource if they wanted to. Uh, the easiest thing that they could do, and we've, we, we kind of touched on this, is moving from the what you do to the why you do it. Mm -hmm. That shift in mindset from needing a regulation to really seizing an opportunity to connect on the one thing that is your brand, your water, your freaking product. I mean, between, between that and the, the way you get treated on the phone when you call, that's it game over. So if your water is awesome, which it is 99.99999% of the time, get your ego and, and talk about that. Cause that's the thing. Um, the second thing, and Shri, I think started talking about this is accessibility. It is all about accessibility from a writing standpoint and a design standpoint. And that dumb template that EPA started off with in 1998 got everybody off on the wrong foot because that was a crap template. Mm, can you say that, again? say that again? <laughs> it's a crap template. Sorry, <laughs> EPA. Love you, but... Um, you know, nobody wants to look at that thing. It's, there's no white space. It's, no, it's no. still full, as Shri mentioned, of text that's advanced confusing. Um, sentence structure is awful, written by a scientist. The table is crap, you know, all of that stuff. So if you think in terms of bringing out the white space, and I'm going to let Duke, the expert design, talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, simplistic language, um, not dumbing it down, but simplifying, yeah. it, making it accessible for everybody. I think those two things, third, and I think even Wendy said this, thinking of the, the law or the guidance as the baseline, the, the least you can do. And a lot of utilities just do the least, but really shifting that thought. You know, the outside firms bring a ton of value. One, the first and foremost is they take this nightmare off your hands. Yeah, yeah totally. If you've totally. got, a, you know, if you've got a budget, if you've got a little bit of money, a, a good consultant will meet your budget. They'll say, this is what I can do for you, as opposed to this is going to cost you a hundred grand or whatever. No, no. Second, that they bring is that perspective from an outside firm. Yes, when you yes. start working in water, it's like your brain forgets what it's like to not work in water. Yes, yes. 99.99999% of this American population doesn't work in water. They don't know our science and our words. So bringing that perspective is so helpful. And then finally, third, they can call you on your BS. <laughs> you don't, you let yourself get away with such crap when you're talking to your consumers and your outside consultant will say, you know what, that's, that's not going to fly. Yeah, yeah. People aren't going to hear you. They're not going to believe you, whatever the case may be. So I think there's a lot of value in, in talking to an outside consultant. Oh, uh, love it. Can we just like, yes, sit yes, yes, yes. <laughs> sit on the fact that the requirement for these consumer confidence report did not happen until 1998. 
I didn't even realize that until recently when I was like doing some research, because I was like, assuming Clean Water Act, all of that came out in the 70s, like I would imagine that. And then to learn that it wasn't even a requirement to tell people until like, I mean, I was still in high yeah. school. Like, it's just, I don't know. That's just crazy to me. But um, yeah, so to your point on perspective, to kind of get Duke te- teed up for this conversation, I sent him some homework <laughs> and I gave him some context around uh, the water quality report. And so before I do have a part two to that question, a, a lead up to you, Duke, and just like um, to the point of there are some, what are some of the best practices that you can give when, when working with creatives to make the relationship the most successful? Like that's my main question to you. But before that, I would just love to hear any of your initial thoughts from someone who's not a water person in that homework assignment that I gave you. <laughs> sure. I mean, what, what struck me the most in looking at the material you sent me and then what struck me a second time hearing uh, the folks here talking about with, in, you know, intelligence information about the, the CCR talking about it was just what, what Sam said, that there's this need to shift from the how and the what to the why, the, the Simon Sinek sort of thing. And you have to give utilities a reason to do that, right? If the only reason for this TCR right now is to tick a box, uh, a requirement, then that's all anyone will do, right? Everyone's going to take the path of least resistance, particularly an organization. Uh, But it seems to me that these CCRs are a huge opportunity uh, in a Trojan horse kind of way. You and I, uh, A-Ship and Steph, we talk all the time about how do we cut through the noise? How do we get people to listen to the message we want to tell about our our client or water in general. And people don't care about the future. They simply don't. They care about right now. And the water quality report is a way to situate water as a right now thing. And people want to know what they're putting in their bodies. It's, it's uh, if it's marketed, right, launched, right, released, right. uh, And created well uh, in a simple sort of way that they can understand and you can build into that CCR, the messaging that's important to you, whatever's going on uh, that you want them to hear. The uh, sort of architecture of that is what a ton of industries use, right? The the film industry lives and dies by the summer tentpole movie, a a moment in the year. Uh, The fashion industry lives and dies by the month of September, right? September issue in Vogue. Why can't the water, uh, the water industry utilize the CCR moment as that moment where they sort of say, okay, this is our vision for the year. This is what's important to us during the year. We know that if people are given a, a decent report about what they're putting in their bodies, they'll read what's in it. Um, and so I see an opportunity there. But uh, in terms of what to or how to create it, you know, we use essentially a, a simple for tick box system to, to, to try and ensure that whatever we're delivering to a consumer is gonna be uh, consumed. And that is make it useful, make it entertaining, make it uh, accessible and make it simple. Mm. And by simple, we don't mean as uh, Sam said, dumb it down, uh, but make it, uh, time is of the essence, right? Yeah. People are not going to waste time. Give them the information in the most efficient, maybe efficient is a better word than simple, efficient way. Nice. And so I want to, you touched on something that I want to dive into a little bit more in a second, but um, you've said it, you've done some discoveries with us, with folks in, in water and heard some of the conversations, but like, what are some for, for those who may be listening and ha- aren't familiar or haven't worked with an outside consultant or creative or marketing agency before, like what are some of the like kind of tips that you can give to making that a good working relationship? Communication, obviously being at the top of that list. <laughs> yeah, and it is. And, you know, my experience and everything I've seen, heard or heard about, uh, the number one stumbling block in a creative consultant vis-a-vis client relationship is transparency. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, there are things that the client doesn't want to be completely honest about with their agency. And there are things that the agency feels like they can't be completely honest about with their client. And that may be something simple like, can we really do this annual report for X number of dollars or, or it can be something more complex. Um, But without that 
it's like a relationship with an attorney. Yeah, yeah. Uh, without being completely transparent, you can't get the job done, at least not uh, well or efficient. Yeah. And one of the things that is the most, for us, the most important thing to remember when working on projects that are more subjective, we're talking about communication, we're talking about strategy, we're talking about creative assets like video and, and print and social media, all of those things require us to learn a lot about you. And so just to be prepared going into that relationship that there are going to be, that there's going to be some extensive amount of, you know, what we call discovery happening, where we're going to, we're going to do what essentially feels like speed dating or one-way dating, because we're going to be asking a lot of questions. And I mean, if it's a good discovery, you also get to ask some us some in return, but that we do need to just ask a bunch of questions, get you in the same room, whether that's in person or virtual. And like, we just listen. And what I love about doing that for a subjective art is that we get to ask you questions in a way that are different questions that you may not be used to answering about your utility or your organization, because typically people are not asking you like, if, uh, if your utility had a spokesperson, who would it be? And like getting to get you to think creatively outside of why you do that work. And so just to be prepared to answer a lot of questions when you, uh, when you bring a new firm on, because they, they need to get to know you and who you are as an organization. And I'll add, even if you don't bring on the new firm, but perhaps you assign a new employee that's within your organization already to start doing the CCR, um, that person may not have ever done that before. I'm talking about the old version of me that works for the utility. And those are the same kind of tactics you can use on your for yourself and for your own departments. You can bring in your department heads, you can bring in your water quality, um, you know, your treatment plant supervisors, all of those people in a room and say, we're going to up our game on the CCR. Who's already filling this out? Because somebody already is and bring them all in the room and talk through all the requirements, everything that has to be done, and then ask them all of the fun extra questions to really dig deep in, and get some good creative answers out of them. So yeah, transferable to whether you're bringing a, a vendor in or, or not, you know. Anybody have any like comments to anything we've said so far before I like, I like Wendy has a lot. Wendy, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, a little bit from the the state perspective. You know, earlier I was speaking as just me, but um, you know, the states are an important partner in the CCR, right? They're the ones who are making sure it satisfies the regulatory requirements. And when we're talking about shifting into the why, I mean, you really are talking about shifting the purpose of the CCR. So mm -hmm. I don't want to lose that this is still a regulatory requirement. And I think that it it's really illustrative, the fact that nine states actually complete the CCR on behalf of the water systems. And they do this not because they want to have excellent communications, right? They do this to reduce violations mm -hmm. because they know that the most efficient way for the CCRs to be completed is for the state to do it, not the utilities. Wow. Um, another nine states provide a draft CCR. So you've got 18 yeah. of the 50 states essentially filling out this template. Um, and if if you're talking about, you know, Sam kind of alluded earlier to something I say often, which is the fact that the Safe Drinking Water Act is not a map to being an excellent utility. It is the floor. It is the bare minimum that a water system has to do to stay in regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if people are looking to the Safe Drinking Water Act to provide them guidance on where to go, not really the purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act, you know, yeah. and and not really the purpose of the CCR. Now, I think that the CCR can be used as an opportunity to create a better communications platform. But until you change the statute of the Safe Drinking Water Act, you're not going to get around some of the very tight um, statutory language that has to be provided. Yeah. So, you know, I do... If you think about it as the CCR is the minimum, and even if you're in a if you're a water system operating in a state that completes the CCR for you, 
there is still a huge opportunity for you to build a campaign around that, right? It's, you know, we're not saying shirk the regulatory responsibility and purpose, right? Congress said at a minimum, people need to be alerted of these things and we need to respect that or change it, um, which that's a whole other conversation. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think what, what Sam and Sri and Duke have, have all said here is that we can do more and, and both Stephanie and Arianne too, we we're all kind of saying the same thing, but, um, you know, I, I don't want to forget that regulatory tie and yeah. until you change the purpose of the statute, it is going to be hard to change the purpose of, you know, the actual CCR itself. And right. yeah, to react to it. And, uh, just a quick question, Ariane, to, based on what you just said, Wendy, do you have any sense of how, what size population those 18 states represent? Mm -hmm. Who's getting it this way? How many people out of the U.S.? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, we, I'd have to go back and look into our, uh, we did a survey a couple of years ago on this. And so I'd, I'd have to go back and look um, at which states it is. I just have the summary information pulled up. Can I, can I add, uh, uh, an, add an analogy to that? Uh, Absolutely, so what, of course. Uh, so what Wendy said was 18 states provide some sort of template or, or do the actual CCRs. The remaining 34, uh, oh, sorry, that's 32 uh, <laughs> states, uh, don't do that. They, they leave it to the utilities. That's almost like how you are forced to fill out your tax return, even though the government knows the exact information on how much tax you owe. They could just do it for you, but they just don't, right? Yeah. So that's, and, and, and people get, you know, people trip up. They, they miss uh, adding a few sources of payment, especially if you have multiple jobs, you have, you know, contracting jobs. So, so that's sort of similar. There's, there's lots of information here. It's, it's water quality, it's yeah. uh, you know other you know sort of contaminant communicating so so there are pieces where you think you you want to personalize it but there is some core sort of core issues that the data is solid you know it's already been collected it's been reported it's you know it should not there's nothing to tamper with there is a floor that you need to put out um, it can be made better and I, I think there is a there's a good debate to be had uh, on on how much is possible under the existing statute and and how much is you know to get to the next stage what are the changes do we need mm -hmm. and and there is an epa proposed rule that's that's in the works right right now the congress has realized that ccrs are not doing the sort of basic job of bringing confidence you know building building uh, that trust in the water uh, in the community so so they required epa to modify the language change the rule itself and and come up with sort of you know guidelines on, on how ccr should look like so, so we know that there is that shared understanding, not just among the public, but even among our, you know, elected leaders. So, so that aside, we, there is a good debate to be had as to what's possible now and what what's needed to get to that next stage. Yeah, and I, I to go with what Wendy said about, you know, it, there's a lot of regulatory requirements in there that you don't get to change, and that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I would just like to challenge utilities to. Um, translate that in a simplified way. So you can present all of the regulatory information that the CCR has, um, kind of like your big, thick, old encyclopedias, but like also include a Wikipedia version, like a one pager, <laughs> like a simplified, like, you know, this is the way, it, this is what we're actually saying. You know, when we say, mm -hmm. I mean, we've done that before and we pass this along to the state you know, requires this X amount of language. It was hard. It was hard to read. We sent that terrifying. to terrifying. We sent that to some grandmas in our community and asked them what they thought about it. And they were like, uh, what they were very concerned. <laughs> and then we sent them like, this is what it actually means. And they're like, Oh, well, if you just said that, like, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. That's fine. You know? Yeah. It's so funny, it's ironic the the name the CCR and its confidence is in there and it it, it consumer it, confidence like and and I laugh because it, you know Shri when you were talking I was like you know confidence they're not even getting consciousness like <laughs> you got a C word they're not even getting we're not even achieving consumer consciousness about yeah. quality, let alone confidence and I feel like that's step one yeah. So what I'm hearing is a name change, a statute change. No, like, I mean, <laughs> I've been working in or near government for like almost 15 years now. And so I, I'll be dead when this happens. I'm, <laughs> I'm well aware at how like 
long, the, you're in the long game when you're trying to get things like statutes and such changed. And so like, yes, I'm glad she, to your point that there's that conversation happening already. Like, I hope that it like moves. Uh, but like right now, I just, I would be happy if we just changed expectation, like of ourselves, you know, yeah. like self, self-awareness self, because, uh, to, to Duke's point about like ticking a box, uh, and I think Sri and I have had conversation about this before. I mean, if you take yourself outside of a CCR and you just like look at a different water issue and you look at like lead and copper and the different roles that's coming out around there, there's like more of this expectation to communicate about this more clearly, more creatively, because this is like the, the issue that's so front and center because of Flint in recent years, because of more conversation around this lately and because there's like more movement around regulations right now related to that. And so, but we can translate all of that expectation into the way that we're communicating through our CCRs and our water quality report. Like it's still a water quality issue and it's still something, if not, not every single community in the United States is affected by issues with lead and copper in the same way but everybody in this country is affected by needing to know the quality of their water in some form or fashion. So the fact that we understand that expectation in this very like specific area, but then can't like translate that into the larger conversation that we're happening, that we're having. Um, I think we know how to do it. We just got to like lean into it and it does take extra work. I get it, but it's worth it in my opinion. So. Yeah, right, and and speaking speaking to the rule itself, uh, as as uh, Wendy was pointing out, just you know the requirements. So rule has some flexibility. The CCR rule actually says you can provide information to customers, not just for their home water, but you can post notices in like you know frequented places, restaurants, uh, you know food banks, community centers. But I've never seen one. I'm not. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't want that big CCR, but you know some sort of condensed <laughs> information that says. Your water was tested for these 15 contaminants. We found, you know, this at this level, or you know, all of them cleared. Some sort of information. So we could provide much more information that's not just in the form of CCR. And and the rule itself has some flexibility around doing that. Uh, and it's like once you turn customers away from, you know, your tap water, then you're not winning them back. Mm. Uh, I, I've had a friend, uh, uh, sort of a long distance relative, I, I met few years ago they had a baby I went to their house they live in Philadelphia uh, and they, I noticed uh, you know stacks of water bottles in their uh, apartment and I was like why do you have them and they were like the pediatrician told us the water is not safe and I was like why I mean I they, they look at the CCR there's no there's no lead exceedances the the building itself is huge so I'm, I doubt they have a lead service line there um, so I was not sure, but then once the doctor told them, that's what they are going to trust. I mean, especially yeah. mm. young parents. I mean, I, I have two kids uh, who are young enough. So I know that once, you know, we are very conservative. Once you figure out this is what works, that's what you're going to do unless yeah. it breaks down. So that's the problem. You Once you turn those people away, then next year they're going to a restaurant, they're going to a, you know, a community center. They're like, okay, this tap water, I'm not sure. You know, let's, let's get bottled water off our own. So that's, you know, so we are turning away generations of customers away because we're not doing that outreach. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I want to, yeah. Wait, I have, wait, I got to just, I have <laughs> seen a CCR one time in one restaurant. Ooh. And that's because <laughs> <laughs> I turned it into a calendar and they hung it up on the wall. And ah, they <laughs> that makes sense. Excellent idea. Uh, so that's it. If you haven't seen one of Ariane's CCR calendars from back in the day, we'll have to post the links. They're pretty epic. Oh boy. So, 12 months yeah. of CCR. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I want to bring this back. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you Duke for a second. Um, because sometimes, sometimes I hear uh, utilities believe, especially when it comes to investment, uh, this idea that we'll, we can't invest in marketing. We can't invest in communication. We can't invest in these pieces. We're not Coke. We're not Nike. We're public utilities. We're not playing in the same arena. Um, and, you know, and some of that I understand because I've also heard that one resident come in and just tear people up at city council saying, why are we spending money on hiring this communication firm to do marketing? And, and so like, I do understand the hesitancy there, but um as I said, you are, you are teaching that next gen of creative professionals that are tasked with grabbing people's attention. 
Um, what are some of the most important things for us to remember when communicating with a public that doesn't know us and doesn't know they should care? Because I actually believe we are playing in that same arena, whether we want to be or admit it or not. <laughs> you know, I, I think that that there may be uh, a crack in the premise in the first place. And earlier you said uh, people might need to know about the quality of their water. I, I would submit, I bet you they want to know about the quality of their water. And so to Shree's point, whatever uh, sort of wiggle room there is in the statute to insert other communications to let the public know who you are, which in your analogy, Steph, has to be step one, right? Uh, whether you're Coke or Tiffany and Company or a, a municipal water organization, your task is to uh, is consistency, right? To present with the same set of values and the same uh, relative goals uh, consistently in front of the public. And I would also submit that if public is part of your mandate or certainly even in your name, then that's when communication becomes all the more important, right? When Coke is hiring uh, an agency, Coke is doing it for the bottom line, I mean, yeah. for revenue. But when it's a public municipality, you, it is incumbent upon you to inform the public and to do so in a way uh, that they can comprehend, are willing to, uh, to comprehend and find useful. Uh, and so I would argue to any municipality that, that you are, uh, it's more incumbent upon you to spend money on communications than it is on Coke. They just do it because uh, they want more money. You, you do it because it is an essential, necessary part of your mandate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I gotta, that, I gotta jump in here if yeah. I can. Um, so 90% of the work that I do is helping utilities get costs, get rates approved, right? And it's this crazy, vicious cycle that Duke was touch, touching on, which is people might not like that a utility is going to spend money to communicate. And when they don't, nobody knows the value. And when nobody knows the value, nobody supports the rate increase because they don't support the infrastructure investments. They don't get how this affects their lives from a convenience and an ease and all of the, all the things. So again, I have to tell utilities Communications is a part of your cost of service. You've got to consider it a part of your cost of service because it's complete BS that a city council or a customer is going to say, don't spend money communicating to me and then turn around and not support you <laughs> when they don't know what you're doing and they don't believe there's a need for the infrastructure investment. You can't have it both ways. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great segue into, I, I had emailed you all this question in advance and I emailed you from the table, having just had this conversation with this director that I shared with you because I was so fired up and I think I got everyone else fired up. This was like on a Friday afternoon too. Sorry, y'all. So I sent this, I sent this email that was like, I want to end this conversation with some talking points to give folks to defend, to defend that investment and to speak to that to that ROI about investing and communicating and marketing what you're doing to build a value. Um, because we did know a director who caught flack for the investment that they made on their water quality report. And we're talking, I think the total, and this was to like have the CCR written and designed. Um, I don't even know if this total cost that I'm about to say included the, the postage or what, cause they did send out some of these printed to, to some folks. Um, but like, 30K, I think, was a total investment. Do you realize how insignificantly small that is to the total budget of this water utility? 24 million. Anyways, but, beyond, but beside that, <laughs> and somebody based their whole campaign on like- Their, they're their council campaign. Yeah. yeah, they're gonna cut the fluff out here by whatever. Okay, so I'm gonna get on my soapbox for a minute. So I'm gonna end with this. I would, or this is my second to last question for y'all. Give us some talking points for folks out there to put some of these things that we're talking into action to increase in that expectation. And Sam, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, I, we started the conversation with this. I'm gonna keep you know, sounding the, the drum on it. Communications equals trust. Good consistent comms, more trust. Bad comms, no consistent comms, less fre frequent comms, distrust. 
you're always going to have critics no matter what you do. So get certain about your mission and stand firm on the part of your mission that is, um, you know, instilling trust and confidence in what you do and commit to it, commit to it. And, um, you know, when you can stand up to your city council and your, and your community about, this is what we stand for. This is our brand. We have to make sure that you understand it. I mean, I, you are the pillar of the community. Yes. You guys get me fired up when you, when you, when you told me this was an issue and, and trust me, I, when I was back at the utility, I got those emails too. Why are you spending money on this? And it's like, why, why wouldn't I? Yeah. Didn't me? <laughs> yeah. And for those, for anyone who hears their communications or marketing person talk about brand, which Sam just mentioned, but to you, that is like, why am I worried about a brand? That's a logo. First of all, it's more than a logo, but then just we as communicators need to educate our folks on your brand is your reputation. It is what you have to build trust. It, it's what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. It's what they're saying about you on social media. So that is a part of your reputation and how to build trust. So talking points, I'm going to go to Sri. You are next. So if the utilities do not communicate water quality themselves, somebody else is going to do that for you. Mm. And that somebody can include a wide range of characters from really with nefarious intents to, you know, well-meaning, but still, you know, sort of pushing on the wrong end. So you could have an EWG put on, putting out their water quality yes. reports, good intent, but it does scare customers. You can have filtration companies that, uh, you know, have their own business to drum up. And I've heard that from utility directors saying, we have sued filtration companies because they take our tap water put in a lot of, you know, basic impurities, sand and, you know, just dirty looking stuff and say, hey, here is your tap water. This looks dirty. You need to, you know, buy our filtration and this will, you know, get you there. So, so, so there are a range of, uh, you know, actors who exist in our environment, in our ecosystem, who have their own mission to fulfill. And, and they will take that messaging forward if you don't do that. We have a problem, you know, we have, we have this legitimate problem. And, and there are people actively preying on that. If you, this is maybe not true, I've not gone to the, the, the grocery store in a long time, uh, but frequently before, there used to be this company called Primo, which yes. had a big ad in Safe yes. and Walmart and all that. It's still you know, out there, y'all. It's yes. still out there, okay. Yes. It's, it's a corroding looking pipe, you know, sort of getting into your mm-hmm. water supply. Uh, and then, and then we we googled that company and it's like, who is this? What's their what's their you know uh, mo there? And and there is a whole ad magazine description on who the target audience is. We know that women are more distrusting of water already because you know predominantly mothers. They you know they they have these maternal instincts. So that's one thing. Minorities, racial minorities, black, uh, Latino, they they also have that. So this campaign was targeted at middle-aged white men. Because they have the most trust, bring down their trust. Mm. That's you know. So, so there is a, there is a like a quite a bit of nuance. Duke, Duke might have you know his own take on you know how that works. But but that's that's what we are up against, and the utility really needs to fight it off. And CCR is an is an effective way where you can tell your story at your own pace in your own way. Yeah. And to your point, someone else is telling your story because when you, you said when you searched it, your city was number eight. So one through seven, we're also telling that story. And, and what were yep. they saying? So, yeah, perfect example of that. So I'm going to leave Duke to last, but I wouldn't. Wendy, <laughs> I know Wendy has a lot. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll chime in here on the some of the talking points, you know, yes. um, and I would say this is pretty applicable to honestly any project you're working on. But I'll channel a little bit of Sun Tzu here and, you know, know your enemy, right? Know Mm. your critics, understand their point of view and why they are a critic. Um, And and I, when you sent out this email, I asked what was the reason that they weren't supportive, right? Is it just the num, you know, the sheer, we don't want to spend this much money or is it, this isn't worthwhile at all, or we have better things we could put the resources towards. I mean, understanding that position is going to be critical to, to building a case for you to justify, because you are going to have to do that for probably, and I'm sure everybody on this has experienced that for particularly for a communications project, but really for any project that you're working on, you need to build a case and you need to have legitimacy, right? Like, you can't kind of fluff your way through this, particularly in a water system where you're dealing with 
engineers often who want to see um, the numbers behind it, right? So you're gonna have to do a little bit of work to prove yourself. Um, and to that point, if, if you are moving to something like a website, which I mean, ding, 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 that's where I get all my information. I don't listen to local news. I don't have a newspaper, subscri local newspaper subscription. It's Twitter, right? And I mean, that's where I get my news. Yep. So um, if, if you're not active in there, you, sh you should be getting active um, in those spaces. But um, the amazing thing about some of the newer modes of communication is you have legit metrics, right? Mm -hmm. They give that to you. You cannot tell me how many people opened your mail CCR. You can't even actually tell me how many people that mailbox it made it to, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is some, you know, legitimacy there in moving to these um, other modes of communication that might seem like an upfront investment, but you can build a case um, that I think will help reduce the um, concerns from those who might be your critics. Mm, absolutely. And that makes it more accessible to everybody, not just the, to multifamily situations, I guess is what I mean, because um, I remember that one year when we sent it out to everyone, not just not to just every mailing address versus every customer account. Mm -hmm. And that year we actually got a handwritten thank you note from a grandmother in an apartment oh, for, nice. yeah. for the water quality report. And yeah, um, that's very sweet. I, yes. I am a hard to reach customer. I do not pay a water bill. It's built into my rent. Mm -hmm. And so um, I get all of my information on DC water. I, they do sometimes send stuff, but I get all of it from, from Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I follow their Twitter account. <laughs> nice. And so last but not least, Duke, your talking points to help us like make that case for better water quality reports. All right. It's interesting that the group you pulled together, I think great minds think alike, and certainly these ones do. Um, you mentioned, Wendy, and I think you're exactly right that you you have to know your enemy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think the the situation in which municipalities seem to find themselves vis-a-vis -vis the, the CCR, I think knowing yourself and knowing your supporters might be at, at that moment more advantageous. You mentioned, Steph, that a brand is what they say about you when your back is turned on social media, et cetera. And that's true. But to everyone's point, uh, if you're not telling your own story, someone else's, a brand is also you, what you say about yourself uh, mm. and what you prove about yourself, right? Uh, through your actions and, and not through just what you say. And Sam mentioned this uh, need to for municipalities to sort of remarry to their mission and, and commit to it. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's going to be the first adopters, the people who support the municipality that are going to help them do something new. Uh, and it's in the values, uh, an old advertising adage, it's in the values that you create value. And so whatever the municipality stands for, whatever their current mission is, leveraging their first adopters, their supporters, and those values are what's going to create value. And because money and public money is what it is, we, I think, have to accept that this process is going to be iterative. Uh, my grandmother, when I would get, you all know I'm impatient and I want things to get <laughs> done immediately. And my grandmother used to say to me, Duke, how do you eat an elephant? And I would say, I know, Grandma, one bite at a time, right? <laughs> and so it's going to have to be little steps, but uh, to Wendy's point, measurable steps mm -hmm. uh, with metrics that you can go back to the public iteratively and say, look, this worked, look, this worked, look, this worked, and build towards something that with concept proven, uh, that's actually meaningful and, and useful to the consumer. And data viz has to be the first step to me. I mean, yeah. uh, we were talking about the language that's required in there, just give them something else to look at other than that language that, that says the same thing, something that solves the translation problem tree. I mean, to me, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think just accepting that whether you want to admit it or not, we're playing in the same arena as Coke and Nike. We're all, they're all, every single person trying to communicate with us now is vying for our attention in some way. And they have significant budgets to put behind it. So even if we can just like use the relationships, the partnerships that we have, uh, in our communities already to help us spread the word and to, and to help amplify that a little bit more. Um, 
your educators and communicators in your in your municipalities, if you have them, have some of these relationships in place. And so just knowing who it is within your own organization to reach out to, I feel like that's a big call to action for me is just making our own industry aware of the people that are doing this work in their own organizations. Because a lot of time at the at the association levels, even the state association levels, there's like a room full of engineers that are trying to do all of this comms work and public education and outreach work. And I'm yes. like, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys know that there's probably someone in the city who does this, right? The utility. And they're like, what? So, I mean, like, but I'm not like, not a dig on engineers. I'm just saying, if you don't know, you don't know. And so just like, I'm trying to build more awareness of the people out there that are doing this work anyways, that could be a great resource to you, yeah. not only from as a resource, but insight um, and can leverage those partnerships and building those relationships to help um, maybe uh, help you out where like you can't get budget for what get the budget you can and what you can't just work on those relationships and those other tools that you have in your toolbox to use. So um, any final thoughts before I ask y'all the biggest question that we're going to end on? Oh, I got one quick one, Stephanie, yeah. just based on what you just said, which is, you know, I think that in the early 2000s, it was really about getting utilities to at least communicate. Mm -hmm. And then over the teens, they mm -hmm. started to do that, but they're really awful at it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to just say, stop being nerds and think about what a person outside of the utility might think. Yeah. Like if you're going to tell them we're flushing, don't use flushing because everybody, since they're a baby, it, like thinks it's something a is a flush. Yeah. It's a toilet. Yeah. So, so don't say you're, you're doing directional flushing for, you know, whatever, <laughs> like think of your customer and what are you doing? You know, yeah. we're cleaning the hydrants, yeah. Yeah. the hydrants, whatever. Yeah. So anyway, um, think about your words and the people you're talking to and put it in their words. Not and yours. that's why comms and, and marketing people are so important to the equation because we help you translate the nerd. I mean, we <laughs> help take what you say and translate the nerd and be a nerd. And we're just going to say, no, this is what they mean. And people are like, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I get Facebook it. Post, do you see this time of year that says water quality reports are here and there's a link and, <laughs> and you just scroll through. Cause you're like, what, who, like, who yeah. cares? Like figure out how to say it. Yeah. Cause again, to Sri's point, I'm not looking at that until I'm having a weird side effect. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right. So we're going to end with this question that we ask every single podcast guest, uh, Sam and Duke are, are seasoned water and real life podcast guests. So we're going to see if, uh, they're going to bring us some new answers. So I'm going to start with our newbies, Sri and Wendy. So Sri, I'm going to start with you and I'm going to give mm, some context like first. So with our role as being public educators and communicators, you know, behavior change is our metric. And so we would have some people say though, what difference does it make if I make a change? I'm just one person um, that I'm not gonna like change the whole world, I'm just one person. And obviously we wholeheartedly disagree with that. We believe that change can be contagious and you never know what your change is gonna inspire in others. So the question is, what is the one call to action that you're most passionate about that you believe could ultimately change the world? make people realize the value of tap water. As Sam said, this is the biggest resource sitting in, cheapest resource sitting in our house. It is valuable. It is valuable because it is expensive. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to treat, to receive, to convey, get into your homes and then flush it out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the single greatest achievement in human life, I would think. I mean, you know, providing accessible, cheap water quality that can save lives. So that's, you know, I, I would go on and, and, and bring as many people who can, who can speak the message. If you can get, you know, LeBron James to talk about it, we'll do that. You know, if you can get Davis to talk about it, you know, get as many people excited and oh, get people who can talk to other people. <clears throat> Love it. Yes, I agree. Uh, Wendy, what's the one call to action you're most passionate about? Oh gosh, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but one one that I think I has has been um, pertinent lately is um, a call to um, progress rather than a call to perfection. Mm. And you know, as Duke was saying, it's it's going to be iterative. It's going to be small steps. And you know, I'm a I'm a firm believer in um, you know like the power of thought and setting goals. But 
one of my favorite quotes is um, by Wes Jackson, which is, if your life is, um, if your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. Mm. And that, I mean, I love that anytime I'm feeling discouraged, I think about that because I mean, that really means progress is going to be incremental and you have to be okay with that. And yeah. um, eventually you'll pass the baton off to somebody else the way it was passed off to me. Yeah. So, um, you know, just encouraging people not to let perfection get in the way of, of the, the small progresses that really are huge wins. Yeah. Love that. I'm going to write that down. And that reminds yeah. me of my favorite quote from Hamilton or one of my favorite quotes, which is legacy is planting a seeds in a garden you never get to see. So um, and so, it rhymes. And it, of course it does. <laughs> Lynn manuel golly. Oh, <laughs> the best. So Duke, call to action. Gosh, um, I have so many too. Um, <laughs> uh, the one that, that won't leave my mind since you, you set us up with this, uh, Steph, is kind of based in the premise of the question you asked us. And I think mine has to be to recognize that uh, an individual can to, to go out and seek information, seek proof and find that an individual can change the world. Mm -hmm. uh, throwing another quote in the mix to muddy the waters, you know, Gandhi's be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, people see you change. They recognize that they can. Mm -hmm. um, also, Rocky won big change, right? <laughs> <laughs> Throw another quote in the mix. But um, and individuals do make a tremendous. In fact, it's individuals who make the difference all the time. Yeah. Uh, and we can sort of to Wendy's point, look at this, this massive uh, sea of changes that need to be made, or we can uh, made by many, many people, or we can look at what we can do now as an individual to uh, affect change and take steps to do that. Um, so my call to action would be recognize that you as an individual can induce change and, and do so. Yeah, and I think an important message, the very premise of this conversation with the Gandhi quote is that like change really begins with you. And I know that we all really want our customers to change something. We all have like something that they want to change and that it really happens with how we change the way that we're having that conversation. Yeah. So I'm uh, going to end this with Sam, the mic drop Viegas. What do you got for us? Call to action. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. So my, my colleagues here all had more than one. So I'm going to follow suit and give you two. Okay. First for the utility, have courage, hmm. grow an ego and, and build on and have the courage to do what you should be doing, which is, you know, your mission, you know, build that brand, have an ego that for the customer pause and appreciate public works because life is a mess without it. And it builds off of what Tree said, it's more than water, it's wastewater, it's solid waste, it's recycling, it's the roads and the bridges. Imagine for a second life with all that stuff and how little you really pay in the grand scheme of things to keep that stuff looking good. If it was a way for even a day, I think you'd all be willing to pay more. So pause and appreciate it. And then when it comes time to invest, give the money out, give mm -hmm. the money out. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that. There's no clean substitution for a uh, wastewater treatment, a bucket. I don't know. So however important <laughs> tap water is, gosh, we, we all learned during the ice storm what can happen. And we our, did. And there was yes. no buckets. OK, I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, before go. we wrap up, mm -hmm. I just wanted to all of all four of you said um, some pretty awesome things. And I took my top one from each of you. Ooh. Um, so I just wanted to, at the very end of this, say what my favorite thing was um, for those of us who were trying to write notes and <laughs> there was just too much. Um, so here's your top four takeaways. Ooh. Um, prescription label. Okay. <laughs> Cut the BS. Be a, you're a pillar of the community. Trojan horse. And then the bonus is, hello, your CCR is your Vogue moment. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, hello, hello. Yeah. Why is Water Quality Month not July when these oh. are all coming out, the deadline? <laughs> and why is Drinking Water Week not July when all these are coming out? Like, come on, let's have like Water Week. Like, I want Water Week to be Fashion Week. That's a new lab, uh, <laughs> new lab that's, goal. That's so a good one, yeah. Thank y'all for, for 
all of that. I mean, my gosh, that is so awesome to hear you guys say that. Yeah. I know that all of you are incredibly busy people. So I really appreciate and humbled, honored by you taking the time to have this conversation with us. Very important one for us. And I hope that everyone listening and watching feels empowered and inspired to um, level up. So thanks again for being with us. And I'm sure this conversation with all of you will happen again. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you. We are so grateful for each and every one of you, all the members of our listening community. The Water in Real Life podcast is a Rogue Water Lab original. It's hosted by the H2 duo. That's us, Stephanie Corso and Ariane Shipley. It's produced by Rogue Water Lab, 12 Midnight, and Matt Black Sound. Sound design and music by Andre Black and Matt McNeil of Matt Black Sound. For more Water in Real Life, check out our YouTube channel and sign up for our lab notes. You can find both at roguewaterlab.org.